organic thing too, not. Yeah, awesome. Welcome to Get It Growing with the Lafayette Master Gardeners. I'm Stuart Goche, County Agent with the LSU Ag Center, and today I have with me Ms. Janae Foley, who's in charge of our nursery beds with the Lafayette Master Gardener Group, and Ms. Kathy Troynowski, who's in charge of our gumbo garden and our vegetable garden area. And today we're going to be focusing a lot on organic gardening, and that's going to kind of be the theme of our show. And what we thought we'd do is we'd kind of show you some different products you might want to use in the organic garden. Um, we get a lot of calls at our office every year about gardening, and usually when people have an insect or a pest problem, that's one of the first things that they, they'll ask about. Well, what could I use that's going to not be as toxic, or I'm trying to organic garden? And in, in the past, there haven't been a lot of chemicals for us to recommend, but that's changed in the last few years. And we brought some products out here to just show you how there's a wide array of different products that are even available if you want an organic garden today. We're also going to have an organic gardening conference coming up that the Lafayette Master Gardeners are putting on at the Clifton Chenier Center. And it's going to be on March 15th from 9 to noon. And if you're interested in attending that organic gardening conference, you need to call our office at 291-7090 so that we can sign you up for it. I think it's going to be a really good event. We have some speakers coming in from LSU and also the Southern University Ag Center. And we also have some local growers that are going to talk about some things that have worked for them in growing organically. And we'd like for you to come out and take part in that. And you said, Stuart, and it's true, that even up until five years ago, it used to be hard to find a lot of organic products in your discount centers and your, your farm supply stores. But we're seeing more and more as, as people ask for these products, people, people are stocking them. And now we're going to have to learn how to use them correctly. Because one thing to keep in mind is that even though these are quote unquote organic products, you still need to read the label and follow label directions carefully. I've used an organic pro, uh, vinegar that was a concentrated product that was as toxic as any chemical that I've used. So even though they're labeled organic, I think it's important to keep in mind that you read the labels and use the product correctly. And the thing with these products that are available, um, we have some people even trying to grow vegetables commercially, organically. And you are restricted. If you want to call yourself a commercial organic right. grower, um, you can't go on the side of the road and sell vegetables organically unless you follow certain guidelines. And the Louisiana Department of Agriculture is in charge of licensing people as organic growers. And so if you're buying organic produce from somebody, they should be following those guidelines. And there are lists that um, we have available at our office we can send you of the different products that are available. Um, you can't just use um, any product that you want and call yourself an organic grower. But all these products that we have on display here are, and we're going to talk about some of them, you can use if you're growing an organic garden. I think what's even more important than even dealing with products is, is the practices that you use. And um, we thought we'd have Kathy talk a little bit about what are some things you might want to do in terms of cultural practices. Yes, one of the first things that we've done uh, at our UL horticulture farm is to ensure proper site selection. Uh, that will ensure more in getting yourself some good, healthy vigor in your plants. So pick first, find the sunniest spot you have. Uh, the more sun, the better. Also, avoid placing your plants uh, near a wall. That will encourage a lot of fungal growth because the plants won't be able to uh, dry out. So get a wide open sunny spot, keep your plants away from the wall. Also, if you can, uh, notice the direction of wind growth. If you have rows of plants, it's always good to have the wind blowing with the plants so that that can also dry out the dew in the morning. If you have trouble getting a full day sun, still you should aim for getting at least that morning sun on the plants to dry them up as much as possible. That kind of uh, gets rid of a lot of fungal problems that you might have. Also, if you're planting something like beans, a lot of people like to plant their beans very closely to shade out weeds, and that's fine. But if you notice that you are starting to get some leaf spot or a lot of fungal problems, then go ahead and space those beans out and pull out the hoe and get to work on those. You've just got to work with this um, and do what Mother Nature needs as far as keeping those diseases down. 
Right, and we always keep talking about, we, we go back to this and go back and go back to this on the program, is select the proper plant, use varieties that are suited to Southwest Louisiana, you know, all this information you can get from the Ag Center bulletins, and then place your plant in the proper site where it gets, as Kathy said, you know, we have so many problems with fungal diseases in Louisiana that the more sunlight you can get on those plants, the quicker you can get them dried off. And you, you, don't, you, you want to actually prevent disease and not be as much as you can using products, whether they're, you know, organic or chemical, to solve problems. You know, if, if you don't have the problem in the first place, you're just that much ahead of the game. But if you do end up... <laughs> Yeah, then, then you have to resort to some product. And I think it's important, like, like Kathy and Janae were saying, that plants are a lot like us in terms of our immune system. If, you, if, you keep, if you're strong and you keep that plant really healthy, you're not going to have to use a lot of products. And a big part of that is getting that soil real healthy. When you're going to grow organically, you need to have a really good, well-drained soil, um, a lot of fertility in that soil. And if that plant is actively growing and growing real fast, not going to have near the disease problems and I can tell you with some diseases say like early blight in tomatoes you get early blight in tomatoes as the plant matures and gets older it makes its crop of fruit it starts running out of energy that's when that fungal disease moves in and we see that time and time again whether something's being grown organically or conventionally diseases are opportunities they move in when that plant is weak so keep those plants strong and growing and you're not going to have to use near near the amount of, of chemicals um, to try to resist disease. And you've said too, it's really important to keep mm -hmm. a ma uh, uh, your planting times mm -hmm. of, uh, according to certain times in your season. Right, and, and that's a really important thing when you're organic gardening because insect problems build as the year goes on. So if you could get your tomatoes planted around March 15th, you're going to be harvesting tomatoes in late May, early June. If you don't plant your tomatoes though until say, you know, April or May, late April, late May, you're going to be harvesting tomatoes in July and August and that time of year it's raining every day, disease problems are horrible, um, the stink bug numbers start going out of control and it becomes a disaster. So for us to grow organically it's very important to, to plant early and I can tell you like growing up with my grandparents, um, they like to garden. They grew, I, my grandparents pretty much grew organically, they didn't use any chemicals right. but they were very very um, competitive in terms of planting early and even something um, like potatoes, and we brought some potatoes here. I remember growing up, that was one of the things that they would compete. Mm -hmm. Who could grow the first Irish potatoes? Right. So one of my grandfathers, he'd plant Irish potatoes around Christmas, you know, just to have them really early. And he might, he might lose them sometimes because, because of frost, but he had very few pest problems because the potatoes would start making for Easter. And a lot of times it was who could have the first fresh potatoes for, for Easter. Easter. So he avoided a lot of insect problems by planting real early. We brought some potatoes. This is the time of year you want to plant potatoes. Um, there's some things with potatoes you need to know. One, if you're going to plant potatoes, you really need to go to the feed store and buy some seed potatoes. If you go to the grocery store and just buy some potatoes off of the shelf, what will happen is that a lot of times those potatoes were treated with a growth regulator to keep them from sprouting. Mm -hmm. So you'll plant them and then they'll never come up. Um, so they're not very expensive. Just go to the feed store, get you some certified seed potatoes. And that way you know they haven't been treated with anything that will keep them from sprouting. The most common variety we grow is the red Lesota. And about how many pounds would somebody need to buy? Well, you usually, a pound of potatoes will almost plant, I think, about 8 or 10 feet a row. It depends on how small you're going to cut them. Um, but potatoes, um, you can buy potatoes cheaper than you can grow. Mm -hmm. And that's something you have to know going into this. Don't think that you're planting these potatoes because you're going to come out financially on it. It's a losing proposition. By the time you buy the potatoes and the fertilizer, not making any money. But if you eat fresh potatoes, they're very, very good. They're not as starchy as the ones that have been sitting at the store for six months. They're, they're very good when they're fresh and when you dig them fresh. So you're, you're planting it more as just a hobby. But I'll go out and buy potatoes, and there are different sizes that you can purchase. And people have different theories on what size you should buy. But basically what you need to end up when you plant is something about the size of a chicken egg, is what I like to plant about this size. And if you buy potatoes that are about this size or you select these out, um, you can plant the whole potato. And especially in the fall of the year, we usually don't cut potatoes. We'll just plant the whole potatoes in August. In the spring, you can plant the small potatoes or you can buy larger potatoes and cut them. We usually try to plant potatoes by Valentine's Day. It's kind of a 
you know, a, a, a holiday that you can link it to. If you need to cut the potatoes, like we said, you want to end up with something about the size of an egg. So a potato this size, we just simply we would cut it in half. And this would be about, about right. Some people, I know my grandparents in their day, they would cut the potatoes very small. And at that time, I guess people um, were, were, were hungrier than they were today. Some people will even just scoop the little eyes out and then eat the inside of the potato. Mm -hmm. But we don't recommend that. If you want a potato that gets a good start, I would cut something like this probably into about six pieces. And, um, and you need to make sure that you end up with an eye on each piece. If you cut it where there's not an eye, it's never going to come up and grow. And I like to buy the potatoes about two, three weeks before I'm going to plant them, bring them inside my house where it's warm, and let them start sprouting, and then plant them. If you plant potatoes that aren't sprouting very often, it's going to take a long time for them to come up. Uh, potatoes also, once you, you cut them, people will do different things. Some people will dust them with a little bit of sulfur powder um, to make that, that the potato dry up. Also, sulfur will create kind of an acid reaction in the soil, which is good for potatoes because if you, you want to grow them in an acid soil. If you grow them in an alkaline soil, what will happen is you have more problems with a disease called scab that causes your potatoes to have an, a real ugly skin. So, in summary, basically, you're going to plant your potatoes on February the 15th, and you're going to plant your tomatoes on March the 15th, more, more or less. And those are good practices just in general gardening. Kathy, tell us some more about organic production tips. Okay, tips. so you've got your potatoes planted, you've got your tomatoes planted, and it's also time to think about conserving that moisture in your soil. Use a mulch. Keep that moisture in. Uh, you can use manure, compost, anything such as that. Um, also, we like to, at our garden, we like to lay down a plastic that's got some silver reflection on it. This plastic not only holds in the moisture, but it also serves as a reflection to um, chase away some of the insect pests. They don't like to fly around that reflective surface. And, and plastic mulches can be used in organic gardening. They're not going to become a component of your soil. You're going to get them off before they deteriorate to that extent. So they are allowed in organic gardening. Another component that you're going to have at home that can be used as a mulch is regular newspaper. Uh, black and white newsprint is the the news the ink is soy based. If you take um, 15 or 20 sheets of newspaper, wet it and put it under your pine needles or your compost, whatever you're using for mulch, it, it acts as a barrier to weed growth and is a great, you know, organic compound. That's, that's good to be used whether you're, you're gardening organically or, you know, choose to use chemicals. It's cheap, it's readily available. And totally biodegradable. And, right, totally biodegradable. Now, same thing with your uh, mulches that you use. At the end of the season, you have the added bonus of being able to dig those into the soil and thus enrich your soil. Also, as you're watering, make sure you're watering the soil and not the foliage. A lot of people tend to uh, put the hose on, sprinkle it, and also, uh, if you don't have down a compost, water hits that soil and then it splashes back up on the leaves, gets dirt on there, and spreads diseases in that manner. That's a real problem with the, um, oh, what's the, the plant that, that in the summer, everybody wants to grow and then gets the fungal disease from, from the rains, the spring rains bouncing up on it. With tomatoes, we get and a lot. And periwinkles, that's the word I was talking about. Oh, oh yes, periwinkles. We have wet years, right. periwinkles um, will die. And they do, periwinkles always, they're from Africa, and they always right. do best when we have a super dry summer. So, and, and, but if you can get a mulch around those too, it, it helps. We just have so many fungal problems in this part of the country. Yes, we do. So um, that's mainly the thing. Keep that soil covered. You'll not only eliminate fungal diseases, uh, but also blossom in rot in tomatoes. Tomato plants don't like that variety in moisture. They don't like the soil moisture fluctuating. Um, also, if their calcium levels get too low as well, then you can wind up with the blossom in rot. But we have not had that problem yet because, again, we have kept our soils covered for the last couple of seasons.
And, and that's something that you might mm -hmm. want to run a soil sample. Every two, three years, it's a good idea to mm -hmm. test your soil. That's something we do at the county agent's office. If you'd like to do that, you need to bring in a pint of soil, taken at a depth of about four to six inches. What I like to tell people is walk around the garden, take some soil from maybe 10, 15 different spots, mix it together in a bucket and bring in a pint of that mixture. And um, do a routine soil test, it'll cost you $7, but it'll tell you. If you need calcium in your soil, we'll tell you that. Um, if you need to, to lime the soil, we'll tell you that. If your phosphorus and potassium are low, things like potassium are very important for the immune system of the plant. If you're trying to grow a garden and you have low potassium, those plants are going to be real prone to disease. And we said when you organic garden, you need to have those plants very healthy. Um, there are things like wood ashes that you can add to the soil that will lime the soil and will also bring up the potassium in the soil. Phosphorus is important in the soil for reproduction, for the plant to flower and to make fruit, um, for the stems to get large in size. So you really need to have a high level of nutrition for those plants. And a soil test for $7 will tell you all that. If you don't, you're kind of spinning your wheels. Kathy was talking about like blossom end rot from low calcium. You're going to get blossom end rot if you let those plants dry out and if you have low soil calcium. I want to talk a little bit about some of the products that you might consider using. And there again, I wouldn't use some of these products um, unless I would do a soil test. One thing I wouldn't use is lime. You want to test your soil and you want to know if your pH is low, then we're going to recommend liming. But you don't want to routinely just add lime to your soil because what you can end up doing is you can get your pH too high and then that creates a whole set of problems. Also depending on what you are growing, we talked about potatoes. If you're growing Irish potatoes mainly in your garden, you don't want to lime a lot because if you're putting a lot of lime in that soil, you're going to have more problems with that scab disease. So it's important to get the soil tested and not to add things like lime unless you really need them. Sulfur is the same way. Sulfur will lower the pH of your soil. It'll make your soil more acid. And we will tell you on your soil test whether you need to do that or not. You don't want to routinely add sulfur to the soil because you'll end up dropping your pH too much. And it, it's very difficult to reverse that. These products like sulfur and lime work very slowly in the soil. We've had people buy these little home test kits and they'll use those little home test kits and they'll test it every month and then keep adding more and more lime or sulfur. You don't want to do that. They take six months really to work and kick in. And if you add um, amounts of sulfur before you let that six months um, period elapse, a lot of times you end up putting too much. So put the lime, put the sulfur, wait a year or two and then test it again or wait six months Give it some time to work before you add any more. Other things that'll work, um, if you need to bring your, your phosphorus up, you can use things like bone meal, very good source of phosphorus. And um, especially if you have a small garden, you're not looking at, at a whole lot of expense in organic gardening. If you're using planting an acre, then it becomes a lot more expensive to use some of these products. But most people are growing little square foot gardens, um, little four pound bags, something like this will work just fine for most organic gardeners. You don't need to buy a 50 pound sack. As a nitrogen source, you can use blood meal, which is a 12-0-0, it's 12% nitrogen, or you can use up to 30% of your nitrogen in an organic garden, a commercial operation, can actually come from nitrate of soda. And nitrate of soda is actually, comes from, um, it's extracted from a rock in South America. They'll leach out, they used to call it Chilean nitrate, I think it originally comes from bat droppings and over time um, they take the, um, the rock and they, they leach the, the nitrate of soda out of it. And um, So you can use this fertilizer, we've used some in our organic garden, up to 30% of your nitrogen can come from nitrate of soda. There's also things like fish emulsion that also work good as a good nitrogen source in your garden. What are some, we talked about this earlier, what can you expect if you use some of these organic products though in terms of attracting wildlife? You can attract a lot of wildlife <laughs> <laughs> using natural fish emulsion. You know, they have some that's supposed to be more deodorized and I haven't found it yet. I mean, they're great for the plants. There's nothing better for your ferns than fish emulsion. But you have to be prepared, you know, to have a little a little smell and with the bone meal uh, and the blood meal too and and dogs will dig in your bed I mean that's a fact of, of of using those those products you know raccoons other animals I mean they think they're going after a food source and the other thing you know there are other things like soybean meal cottonseed meal are all good nitrogen sources um, cow manure one thing to remember with these 
uh, organic fertilizers, they break down slower, which is good in a way because they feed your plants over a longer period of time. You put a handful of 888 on next to your plants, that 888, as soon as you get a rain, is going to work immediately, mm. but it's going to kind of be gone immediately too. Whereas these organic fertilizers, they're going to break down over a period of months or a year. And so when you use them, you just have to be prepared that you're not going to see maybe that quick green up that you would use if you put some miracle Grow or something like that on those plants. Now, is there any danger of mad cow disease from the bone meal? I've never, I've never heard that. I know at one point I had heard something on TV that was a scare because one of the, some, a person that had, had the um, Crushfeld's Jakob's disease was an avid rose garden. Mm -hmm. And there was some, some, you know, information in the news at one point that they were concerned that maybe he had gotten something from blood meal or bone meal that he'd used in, in his garden. But I haven't really heard anything about that being a concern since then. Now, we are accepting, as, as Stuart introduced us, he referred to both Kathy and I as Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners. We are accepting applications for the 2006 Master Gardener class, and ma applications will be accepted until July 14th of this year. There's an application blank that you can get from the uh, Cooperative Extension Service, fill that in, mail it back, fax it back, send it back any way you can get it. A master gardeners complete an education course and then are asked to do volunteer hours in the community. You can select the, the projects that you're interested in. You do 40 volunteer hours your first year and 20 thereafter. You know, if you're interested in learning more about gardening, being involved with some wonderful people, and returning education to the community, then apply for this program. Uh, as we said, we're accepting applications till July the 14th. You can call Cooperative Extension Service for one of those applications. And Kathy, give us a few more hints on controls. Okay, sure, but I want to mention with the application, um, the nice thing about uh, becoming a Master Gardener is that you stay up with the latest trends. Right. When we started our garden, we were not organic, but we found that the public has wanted more and more of the organic hints. So we have been going to workshops and going to these sorts uh, of uh, ideas that would get um, our organic garden rolling. Um, in summary, kind of what we've been doing with our new organic garden that's only been in production for three or four months now, we've been organic, uh, mainly, we emphasize planting at the right time. We are fixing our corn bed right now. We've got it plowed under, and in a matter of a very short time, we're going to be setting some corn out as soon as it gets warm enough. That will avoid problems with corn earworms. And of course, after we finish with the corn, we will plow that all under, get rid of any residue. So that's another thing. We try to keep our garden area very, very clean. And I want to remind everybody that when you do have pest problems, uh, sometimes it's best just to go and pull up those plants if they are too infested and replant. Also, um, yeah, keep it clean, replant it if necessary, and don't put insect infested things into your compost pile. Bag that separately and put that out. Stuart, you want to briefly touch on some of the, the chemical controls that you can use that are organic? One product that works really well that we recommend a lot is this ultrafine oil. And ultrafine oil has a real broad spectrum for use in the vegetable garden, also like on fruit trees, also on ornamental plants. It's very good against um, a lot of your soft-bodied insects like um, white flies and scales, um, aphids. And what's nice about it, most of these organic products have a very short cutoff or no cutoff at all. This product you can actually spray it the same day that you harvest. If you use it properly, um, you shouldn't get any plant damage. Sometimes though, and we've had some bad experiences, if you have, like if you use like silver plastic or you spray it on a hot day where there's a lot of light being reflected on the plants, we've seen maybe some problems with burn on vegetable plants, but on citrus, worked very, very well at cleaning up like a white fly problem. We also have some other things that we use um, routinely. This is um, an insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soaps are similar to oils. Now they work really well against a soft-bodied insect. This is probably not going to do much against a beetle or, um, or a caterpillar, but it will work well against like an aphid or a white fly or a mite. And this is a product that um, actually has neem oil, which is an extract, I believe, from a tree that has some activity, both I think as a fungicide and an insecticide. 
and then it's mixed with a soap. So it works well, um, very non-toxic. This is a newer type product that recently was labeled and it's sold a couple different ways. It's called spinosin. And um, spinosin has a very wide spectrum against um, caterpillars. It also kills some beetles, like Colorado potato beetle, it's very effective against. Um, there's a little beetle that gets in mustard plants called the yellow margin leaf beetle. It's effective against that. And this comes from an extract from a soil fungus. Um, it's not very toxic um, at all. It also will kill fire ants. And it works very well in the vegetable garden. It's sold as conserve or as fertilone bagworm and fruit tree spray. Well, we want to thank you for joining us for our show today. And um, we hope that you'll come out and come to our organic garden.